Ladies and gentlemen, in the blue corner, standing at a sleek 5 foot 11, 245 pounds, the tumultuous tempest of technique, Thomas Lilly. And in the red corner, at a curvaceous 5 foot 11, 315 pounds, the jovial juggernaut of judgment, John Cheryl Sheridan. A meeting of the masters of mastication. Turn your attention as they delve deep into all things lifting and more. This is Peak Speak. That means we're back for another episode of Peak Speak. Um, all right. Today we have a very special guest, Ali Jawad. Am I saying that right? I'm such a pro. Done my research. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Al Jawad is a decorated para powerlifter. He's over here from the UK, training at Burley Strength. Have I messed something up? Why is everyone laughing at me? I was laughing at the, the face that Ali pulled about when you said decorated. Um, but given you're the most decorated powerlifter in this room, I think you can, or as certainly in this podcast, um, I think you can probably just take that. I think it's a, a, I'm just, I'm just a real fan of that word decorated lately. I just like saying decorated everything. <laughs> you now when you, you start using a word and you're just like, yeah, I'm going to use that a bit more now. Yeah, fair enough. I, I do that a lot. <clears throat> what was I, there was a word like that that I was using a whole bunch and then used inappropriately a couple of times. Like, all right, maybe I should move on to a new word. Quite old. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, how, speaking how of then. You, Thomas? Are you, I think you might be the youngest one. How old are you? I don't know how old I am. I am a sultry 29 years oh, of age. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just the old man in the room. 89 babies. You're an 88 baby, right? Yeah. 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 Dear. 88 so, was a better, a better year. <clears throat> it's, um, it's been proven. Ali, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Can you tell us a bit about your, uh, your competition history, who you are, where you're from, what you've done? Introduce yourself to the people, all one or two of them listening to this podcast. Yeah, so um, I'm Ali Jawad and um, I'm based in London. I've been to three Paralympic Games, three Commonwealth Games. I've competed at every kind of major championship. Um, I'm lucky that I've got medals at every major championship, uh, so I've got the whole set. Um, Not quite, you don't have a gold Paralympic medal yet, do you? The, 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 I said medals and it was <laughs> gold. Uh, but yeah, like, um, I've won, I won silver in, uh, <coughs> in Rio. Um, awesome. I've won kind of world championships, European championships, um, two Commonwealth Games medals. So yeah, like um, oh, yeah, over 13 years. So yeah, I've competed at the highest level, and I'm hopefully still compete at the highest level. I hope. What are your um, what are your best lifts, and in what weight class? So um, in competition, um, at 55 kilo, I did 194, and at 54 kilo recently, I've done 165. Um, and um, you were telling me last night off air about the first time you walked into a gym and I would like you to tell that story because it'll make you Thomas and probably me and probably most of our listeners feel bad for themselves um, tell us about when you first came to the gym so um, there was this really hardcore gym across the road from my school so I did my exams and after my exam a friend kind of forced me to go to the gym across the road now I didn't want to go because it was like you know it was leaking everywhere it was this old rundown gym <coughs> men grunting obviously at 16 I was really intimidated by them um, but you know he managed to force me to go and um, we got this bench press in the corner I tried to you know, kind of like stay out of the way of people before I get hit and um, yeah I just started bench pressing and I, I lifted on my, this is the first time I've ever been to a gym or ever lifted weights. So I lifted about 100 kilo and the whole room stopped. And this big guy comes up to me and he's like, you need to stay here, you need to get somebody. And I thought I'd done something wrong. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? I didn't even communicate with anybody. So, <coughs> so five minutes later, this old man comes into the room and he owned the gym. 
but I actually didn't realise that he used to be the national powerlifting coach uh, like 10 years before. Mm -hmm. He kind of started questioning me and uh, what he found out was my first time doing weights and how old I was. He goes, oh, do you mind uh, stepping on the scale? I was like, what? He was like, do you step on the scale? I was like, okay. Um, so he weighed me and then his eyes just literally lit up. He's like, you need to come back. <laughs> your potential is incredible. If this is your first time in the gym, then you need to come back. Now, at the time, I didn't know what 100 kilo was, so I didn't know how good it was. Um, yeah. And he said not many men do it with training. And me only being like 16, being like, only weighed about 65 kilo at the time, he said it was actually quite impressive. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah, so I came back within two years, age 18, I bench 190. So yeah, good. Far out. Uh, yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was like, when you said it's going to make us feel bad, I was like, oh, this is going to be a really sad story. And then it's just like, no, okay, well, you were bad. way strong, yeah, way stronger than us yeah, at exactly. like 12 yeah, kilos body weight. Yeah. Having no legs is an advantage. <laughs> like now, that. speaking of advantages, uh, I've noticed on Instagram you have a blue tick. Can you tell us more about that and uh, if it provides you any success in life? Um, well... The blue tick is there to um, confirm that it's you. So obviously, like, they seem to think I'm a public figure somehow. I don't think I am. Um, <laughs> and yeah, just it kind of makes sure that nobody tries to copy my account, basically. Um, it's it's giving me loads of success, kind of career-wise, and people are jealous of the tick. Um, but apart from that, I'm jealous of the tick. I'm definitely jealous of the tick as well. I think my I think the Burley Facebook page has a like a grey tick, which is like the neck. It's like I think it's a level below a blue tick, okay. where like you're not quite famous enough to get a blue tick, but it's a verified business. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't know how it works because there's no actual firm information about how the how you get a blue tick. Yeah. So you don't have happens. any ticks. Yeah. No, on Facebook I said Facebook. Oh. Um. So, we were talking last night, uh, you've been a part of the high performance program in Britain for a very long time now. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like and, and how you got involved and, and what that looks like today and that sort of thing? So, um, I've been part of the British weightlifting like, world-class performance program since I was like 16. Um, and it's a funded program by the government. So, UK Sport are the um, organisation that is responsible for funding elite sport in the UK. Um, and British Way to get funding from them based on performances at you know the Olympics and Paralympics. Um, so they provide me with a kind of an athlete personal award, which is like a wage, um, and with that comes with like a kind of a team around me that is kind of that works together to you know kind of try and get me better as an athlete. So I work with six or seven staff um, in British Way of thing. Um, you know, psychology, sports science, physio, doctors, nutritionists. So, like, I've got, you know, really kind of, you know, top people kind of working together to, you know, improve me as an athlete. So, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky in that sense. So, does that mean that being an athlete has been your only real job for most of your life then? Um, it's been my only job, to be honest. Excellent. See? We're in the wrong sport, Thomas. This able-bodied powerlifting. Yes, there's no no money in it. There's no cut your legs off. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we picked the wrong now, sport. <clears throat> you're uh, you're training up for a, a competition in a couple of weeks. Can you tell us about that and and what your goals are with future competition? Yeah. So um, the competition in a few weeks is an able body competition. So I have to wear legs, um, which is for me is quite a challenge because. I can't feel if my uh, feet are touching the floor all the time, mm. so I need to like actually um, lie more, I have to change my technique slightly because then I have to actually lie flatter on the bench just mm -hmm. to make sure they're on. So, so, yes. yeah, so because I'm flatter, it's going to make it a little bit harder, um, but you know, I've bench pressed 192 with, with a flat bench, so actually I'm, I'm kind of used to it now, um, but at first it was really hard to balance without kind of you know, uh, not feeling myself um, kind of on the on the bench, so it's quite it's quite a good challenge. And I'd imagine it's a little bit different not having the um, the strap that you get to use in a para bench, right? Yeah, so the strap kind of 
fixity in place. Yeah. Um, it gives me loads of leverage. Yeah. Um, take that away, and because I'm obviously top heavy, um, it was really difficult to kind of fix, my, fix myself on every body bench, especially when the bench is narrower. So you can actually fall Way narrow. Yeah, right. Which is actually, it actually makes it quite dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. But I'm a stunt man, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So that might be a good way to segue into kind of maybe discussing some of the differences between able-bodied and, and para powerlifting. So at my gym we have Lee Skinner who, who you know, uh, he, he's been competing for a long, long time and recently competed at the Commonwealth Games alongside uh, you in, in different divisions. Um, but there's some there's some differences there. Like one one thing that I've noticed since uh, since coaching para powerlifting is the some of the technical rules are a, a little bit different but a, a, far more strict so uh, we took a big team of people to go and watch the Commonwealth Games watch the para powerlifting there and some stuff we noticed was that they're much much harsher on like uh, uneven extension the bar sort of has to be perfectly even as they're coming up there's no press call um, you get a little bit longer time to set up obviously because you're getting help with straps and everything like that can, can you talk us through uh, because obviously you've you've now competed in, in both able-bodied and para powerlifting. What are the major differences? Uh, can you give the people some insight into that? Uh, another, oh, sorry, I, I might wait after you've explained that to ask another big question as well. Okay, so um, the main difference in kind of para powerlifting and able <coughs> is that athletes in para powerlifting use a wider bench, so it gives athletes more support. Um, they also have to be strapped in, right? So, well, you don't have to be strapped in, but it's probably advisable to be strapped in. Is that even if you uh, like actually still have legs but don't have the capacity yeah, as so, well? Yeah. So, like some people will have legs but they're paralysed. Yeah. Um, fixing them in means that you know that you're not gonna sweat. roll roll yeah. off them. Yeah. 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 Um, it's just safe, just safer to probably work to have a to have a um, strap. Yeah. Um, the technique. Well, the, the, the technical rules are very, very harsh in powerlifting. In power of powerlifting. Mm -hmm. um, you have to, it, it basically needs to be near perfect for you to get the lift. Um, but me, kind of growing up, I used to get really angry at how strict it was compared to the able body. But actually, it's taught me to be very, very technically good um, yes. in whatever kind of federal, well, well, whatever federation I lift in. Um, yes. So for me, like, you know, I've always kind of, younger, I had the mindset of, why not adopt the IPF rules and make it less strict so people can, you know, a lot of people kind of struggle with para powerlifting because they don't know why there's a red light. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of makes kind of the, well, the audience kind of engage more with more white lights. I mm -hmm. thought when growing up. But, but now I've got a mindset of actually, like, you know, we are talking about the highest levels of sport. And you know, to win a, to get to the Paralympic Games, you should be technically very, very good. So now I've got a mindset of actually, our rules are, you know, they're strict, but technically means you're one of the best in the whole world. So yeah, I'm, I'm clear it. Uh, so uh, one thing I was going to ask uh, you to explain to the people as well. Um, there's there's a classification system in para powerlifting because obviously if you weigh uh, 50 kilos but you have the upper body of a you know 90 kilo guy it looks like it's advantageous to someone who has their legs fully attached and maybe not completely atrophied because everyone's coming in different shapes and sizes and I, I'm pretty there's a there's a number based clarifications or classification system uh, to give you points either way right can you do, can you explain how that works uh, so you mean so, so basically, in para powerlifting, you're, um, you're split up with body weight classes, so it's the same as the IPF. Uh -huh. um, there isn't, so apart from the Commonwealth Games, which uses the AH formula, everything okay. else is done on body weight and the biggest lift wins. Oh, okay, so what, can you, the AH formula must be what I'm thinking of yeah, then. So the AH formula is only used at the Commonwealth Games or okay. um, when you combine classes together. Uh -huh. At the major championships, bar the Commonwealth Games, it's all done in body weight classes like the IPF. So, can you explain the formula for us? Because I've I've not heard of that before. So. Yeah. So the uh, the AH formula is a called a coefficient formula, which uh, takes your body weight, it gives you a coefficient, and you multiply that coefficient by whatever you left to give you points. Okay. So, so it's it's like Wilkes it's or like Wilkes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's used for you know power powerlifting stuff. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so the Commonwealth Games for me is arguably the hardest comp to win because you know you want to be as light as possible with the formula. Um, yeah. In the middle of the class, when it's all combined, you really have to probably break the world record to have a shot, anyway. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, for me, like the AH NH is, is difficult um, when it comes to Commonwealth Games because of just what I weigh. Yeah. So when you go, uh, so in a para powerlifting comp, you've got two minutes from the, the bar is loaded kind of call, right? To go out and set up and someone can help you strap in. When you go to able body powerlifting, uh, powerlifting you've got one minute. Um, are you allowed to have someone go and help you set your legs on the ground or you have to do that all yourself? No, so um, luckily because of, um, because I can't feel my legs, it gets very, it gets very dangerous if I do it Yeah. So I'm lucky that I'm allowed to have someone to fix my legs on the ground uh -huh. and then kind of, and it's hard to me to try and feel, uh, you know, to try to kind of leap, like kind of place them on the floor and kind of make sure they're fixated. Um, mm. The minute is really difficult for me because it's really fast. Mm. And yeah, if you yeah, yeah. Legs that I can't feel, it, it lit, like it's really difficult. Um, it's, yeah, so for me, it's like it's probably the hardest thing. Um, trying to get in and out of the uh, of the bench in a minute. So, but yeah, it's mm -hmm. a good challenge. You know, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've competed like maybe three or four times everybody have not had a problem yet so obviously I'm doing something wrong. Do you find it uh, do you find it easier or more difficult besides the time thing do you find it more easy uh, or more difficult or easier on a para bench or a able body bench? Oh, no, I find it easier on a para bench. Uh -huh. Able body benches are um, well, it's only inconvenient for me because I have to wear legs. And I don't yeah wear legs. of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, so, to because to, most people are going to be listening to this, not watching this. So, to give people an idea, you're a double amputee yeah, below the knee. I was born without um, both my legs. Um, mm -hmm. It's been just like I've never wanted legs anyway. Um, I save a lot of money on trainers and shoes. So <laughs> I think Thomas is the shoe guy. Uh, Thomas <laughs> Thomas likes his shoes. So uh, I don't think he'll empathise with you on that one, but no, I definitely will because I'm sick of spending fucking money on shoes. <laughs> yeah. Um, we were also talking yesterday about uh, so you have Crohn's disease as well, um, and there was an article came out just the other day about your choices and the the choices you have to make in the lead up to Tokyo. Can you give us a bit more information about? where you are and what are the the options you've got at this point yeah so um i've suffered with crohn's disease for the last like 10 years and i've tried kind of different medications for the for that, for that time and it's getting to a point where that nothing is working for me um right now mm -hmm. so i've been given like two possible like options um one is to have an operation where they'll give me a stomach bag um, and the other option is stem cell therapy, but part of that process is to have intensive chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, and with whatever option I kind of pick um, at the two, retirement is probably the outcome. Um, mm -hmm. I'll certainly will not make Tokyo if I pick any of the options because of the time frame that I have, it's just it's not possible to have treatment, recover from it, and then try to be competitive. Um, yeah. So my third option, which is probably the most, well, it's, it's a, probably the danger is, I reject both options, risk having a massive flare in the next you know, two years, mm -hmm. and um, try and attempt to be as competitive as possible in Tokyo. So um, I'm at a mindset that, you know, ever since I was six, my whole life has been geared up to try with a private gold medal. So, for me, if this is really my last shot, um, I might as well take it and risk it. Because uh, you know the reward at the end could be, you know, lifelong, could be a dream. So yeah, hopefully the two options will be open to me post Tokyo, and I can have whatever treatment I choose then. But right now, my mindset is the gold medal probably means more to me than the options. And I think that's a, um, and we had this discussion yesterday. That that's an a mindset that I don't think everyone has by, or certainly not everyone has, um, but it is kind of part and parcel with being a, at an elite level like that. And you've clearly been an elite sportsman for so long now that, you know, I'd imagine it's probably not actually that much of a choice in that. You probably made your decision before they actually gave you those options anyway. Yeah. Um, 
and yeah i think from a mindset standpoint i'm interested to hear about uh like how you think about those decisions and, and what are the factors that weigh in on, on your side so um for me like um you know british i'm lucky that with british weightlifting they provided me with kind of loads of kind of informed kind of scenarios where if i picked either option um what are the consequences of either option what are the processes what i'm about to go through um so even though my kind of decision can be seen as a massive risk i've definitely like <coughs> sorry i've con considered every possible option and outcome and mm. risk that i could potentially take and <coughs> i'm definitely comfortable making the decision that i've made um because it's very informed we've gone through everything you know and i feel like you know i've done everything that i can to give myself the best kind of choice um into trying achieving my my dream so you know it, i guess the options might kind of improve my kind of quality of life in the long term but i'm always going to regret not giving it my last shot um and i don't want to live with regret and that's the thing like i'm the type of person that you know i want to live life without regrets and you know you can't get bigger than the Paralympic games for me um it's been yeah. since, I was, since i was a kid and you know, i'm lucky to go into free games and you know obviously i won a medal last time but you know the gold medal has always been everything that i've ever worked for so i might as well you know r risk it one last time and then live my life afterwards and this also isn't a decision you're taking lightly or anything like that and it's also i think important to note that you're not like you're not an average person in that you're not just getting advice from an average doctor you've got the best doctors money can buy and, and i'd imagine in many cases doctors money can't buy yeah, yeah. um and so it's not like you're taking this lightly or anything like that um, which yeah, I'd imagine a lot of people in a similar position would make a very different decision. But I think that's the the athlete mindset that some people have and some people don't. Um, and I think that's in the end what separates people from you know top tier to that tier below. Um, I want to sh shift slightly to discussing your role in anti-doping because you you met with Asada yesterday, the anti anti-doping uh, association in Australia, and had a discussion with them. Um, I'm interested to hear about your role in anti-doping and your thoughts on that. And um, yeah, go from there. So um, this is probably quite weird for people, but ever since I started my career, I've been obsessed with um, fighting doping in sport. Um, mm. Probably because, you know, we're, you know I'm, a, I'm a, in a sport that has, um, you know, extensive doping history at the Paralympic Games. Um, we just haven't got, you know, a good reputation as a sport. You know, it's getting much better now um, in terms of, y you know, um, the amount of people, you know, that are, that are getting caught and getting sanctioned and the education systems are, you know, they're, they're better now and, you know, everybody's kind of more aware of their responsibilities. Um, but I've, I've kind of been obsessed with it since I was, you know, since I started. So um, at the moment, I'm on the UK Anti-Doping Athlete Commission. So I represent views of, uh, you know, British athletes when it comes to anti-doping. Um, I'm a massive anti-doping advocate. Um, I'm a big, well, at the moment, a big, I'm a big, you know, critique of, of the World Anti-Doping Agency. Um, and, you know, I was lucky enough to meet with, you know, Australian Anti-Doping yesterday to talk about kind of, you know, their education programs, their kind of, you know, their ambition of starting an athlete commission here um, mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, to engage with the athlete community. Um, I feel like it's really important that an organisation, you know, puts athletes at the forefront of everything they do. Because, you know, at the end of the day, like, athletes are the biggest stakeholder in anti-doping. Like, without athletes, nothing will exist. So why not yeah. put them first? Um, mm. At the moment, um, I don't know if anybody's aware, but WADA have um, reinstated Russia. And without Russia kind of achieving the, the, the roadmap set out three years ago, and that's called massive kind of outrage amongst the uh, athlete community. So, you know, we're, yeah. gonna, you know, we're gonna still keep fighting and, you know, <coughs> one day, um, you know, we we'll probably can never stop people doping, but my view is that we can make the rules as strict as possible. So it's virtually impossible to dope and get away with it. And I, we had, again, had this discussion yesterday, but I think 
powerlifting is a really interesting sport because there aren't many sports in the world that have the option if you do want to take drugs you know like powerlifting you can compete in the ipf and in the tested federations or if you don't want to do that and you want to compete in untested that's an option as well yeah. um which i think makes it really interesting for people who are getting caught done like doping in the ipf and in the paralympics and stuff because you like you have another option you know you're like there's another avenue open to you if yeah, you want so to go down that road so in power power there isn't yeah okay true yeah so an able-bodied um part of there is um, yeah i've always said like i've got no problems people kind of if they want to go down that, that route that's fine just don't do it in a tested federation yeah. so don't mm. lie about it yeah you need don't cheat option. well you've got yeah. yeah so for me like you've got an option of going to a federation that's very open about taking drugs and and you know the rules there's no rules really um mm. in terms of taking stuff but don't come to a federation to deny clean athletes that that chance of competing you know on mm -hmm. a more equal level um because for me it's cheating i mean with them you know when you've got that option there why would you take the cheating option um i, I don't get that yeah um the i had a point there but it's just completely left my head have you had any personal experience with it as in like have you come up against someone that's you know won gold and you've won silver and uh then they've later been uh, you know, called out as a drug cheat that being tested and, and found to be a drug cheat. Have you had any close experience with it like that? Um, not in that sense. So I've never um, had an upgrade on any medal that I've had. Um, mm -hmm. But I've kind of like, you know, you see things and you hear things on the ground that um, kind of makes you kind of think that, you know, maybe people are doing stuff they're not supposed to. Um, yeah, yeah. Because obviously like, you know, in powerlifting especially there are certain nations that you just don't you know you kind of know their anti-doping system in that country isn't that great so they're more yeah. high risk than a lot of other athletes uh -huh. um, so because they're not getting tested or educated the way we are um they're you know they're more kind of susceptible to going down that route um uh -huh. so yeah for, for me like we still got a long way to go where we can have a standard where everyone gets tested like on it kind of an, on an equal kind of level um uh -huh. but yeah that's going to take you know years to implement i think which is why it's so important to highlight uh why um out of competition testing matters so much because if you're what from one of those nations and you've got coaches or advisors around you that are saying to you know you can use this year round it's just when we come to the competition you have to jump off and stop that's a huge advantage for them which is completely unfair uh so you had to 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 it's a big challenge right well that's what i've challenged the authorities i said right how do you police it you know yeah. even if we have a a standard you know globally of you know the number of out of competition testing education programs you know how do you actually police that um, yeah you know if a country wants to dope they'll dope look at russia and russia's yeah. got the you know one of the best anti-doping labs in the whole world and, uh -huh. they, and they managed to implement a doping system so it, you know and not, and not just like one or two athletes yeah, but like a, a, a state at sponsored at least a thousand athletes in that, in that yeah. report yeah. so for me like you know it's it's difficult for wada to implement a standard and police it um we need all the countries to kind of unite and come together and kind of start thinking the same but that's mm -hmm. going to take a long long time so i've got sympathy in that sense but for me um what i've got a problem is is because their, you know, kind of their stance is, well, right now it's, it's, it's quite soft compared to my stance. Yes. That, that, you know, countries are open to do it and mani manipulate the system the way Russia would have done it. Yeah. Um, and because the rules are not as harsh as they should be, we're going to keep seeing this until the rules are so harsh that it's really impossible to do it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but like, I think for me like um there needs to be more funding globally um you know water can't do it on 30 million dollars a year um mm -hmm. and i've always said that they need to probably double that to start implementing you know a, a system that i think might be you know kind of robust enough to to, to handle it um but yeah um it, it's very hard to f find double the funding um you know you know i guess like we need to all kind of come together or contribute more 
Do you think that smaller sports like powerlifting, like para powerlifting as well, kind of get pushed to the wayside with all of it? Kind of aren't looked at as important and maybe don't get as much attention when it comes to anti-doping stuff? Uh, no, it gets, it gets a lot of attention. Um, when it comes to the when it comes to the Paralympics, for example, like because you've got, you know, arguably out of all the sports, the worst kind of doping kind of offences in the last ten years. Um, you know, we are kind of. You know, we've we've got that record of you know it's the worst sport of the Paralympic Games for cheating, um, so we've got that kind of reputation. Um, you know, for me, what I try and do is kind of, I try and. You know, promote clean sport as much as possible, so other athletes follow that lead. Um, so I speak to a lot of athletes. Um, I try and kind of educate them, and we have kind of debates on everything. But you know, one person can't do everything. Uh, we need countries to kind of. You know, work work together, um, and I think the the authorities need to kind of make that happen. We need to get everybody in a room and go right. This is this is what we want. Um, what do you guys want? You know, do you, you know, we're we're here for clean sport and to for athletes to compete at an equal level. Let's let's do that. That's the ambition. Um, it just right now it's just very hard to implement when the the, the levels of anti doping in each country is is different. Um, so switching gears slightly away from the anti-doping discussion, um, and talking training, cause we all like talking training. Um, can you give us a bit of an overview about your training philosophy and like how you approach your training and do you have coaches and stuff like that? Um, yeah, just sort of give us a bit of a background on that. So, um, I, I run my own programs, but like, um, I consult with the, um, performance director at British Weightlifting. He coached me from... 2012 until 2016 uh, as in my personal coach um, a very intelligent man um, I've learned a lot from him um, and kind of putting them kind of philosophies into play like he's, he's very kind of um, we use a lot of kind of science behind everything that we do there's a reason why we do it mm -hmm. um, it's not just I come to the gym and, and bench um, we discuss like everything into detail from, you know, bench press to, you know, prehab, you know, everything gets discussed um, at, in a very detailed way. Because obviously when you compete at the top level, you need to look at everything. Yeah, well, um, all those little factors yeah, add up pretty not, quickly. Not just bench press. Yeah. Um, mm. you know, so for me, like, even though bench press is my sport, if you actually look at my program, it's like all round, very detailed in terms of why we do things and you know we, we kind of try and promote kind of balance and injury prevention as much as as much as possible because you know, if you're injured you can't bench mm. and uh, bench press is all about consistency so is strength you yeah. need to be in it to kind of be strong so for, for me like injury is a big big kind of thing for me in terms of trying to prevent it so have you had any major injuries touch wood not major technically um, i don't think that's wood i think it's wood, wood it's wood veneer oh, okay. so it it's like close that. enough um i've had like niggles um, yep. but nothing that's long term yep. luckily um i think because the way we train it's it's so kind of detailed and i do all the right things that kind of i limit that chance yeah um but obviously when you're at my body weight and you're nearly benching four times body weight you're going to get niggles. It's yeah, yeah. just part of this, just part of it. Well, so. it's part of any elite sport yeah. at that point, right? Like yeah. the the further you go into the realms of performance, inevitably you're pushing the limits yeah. at some point and um, yeah, something's going to break eventually. Well, yeah, like my legs. I'm checking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so given that most of our audience is probably able-bodied, I would imagine, I don't think we get those statistics on our podcast platform. Do you know if we get any statistics on able-bodied versus Paralympians in our we don't. podcast statistics. Anyway, uh, so most of our audience probably have a, a week that's split into like a squat day and a bench day and a deadlift day or, or some variation of that. Yeah, yeah. Can you give us a bit of an overview about what an average week looks like for you in training and how many times a week are you training, what are you doing, that sort of thing? Yeah, so I have three kind of bench press days um, where... so. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I like my bench press days. Um, I formal press twice a week. So what I mean by formal is it's competition specific. Yeah. Like everything is to the rules, every rep's to the rules. And then maybe on Wednesday, I try a variation, a bench press variation. 
So I'm a, I'm a big, big fan, depending on what phase I'm at, I'm a big fan of, it, you guys call it pin press, but yep. I call it rack press. Yeah. I'm a big fan of it. It's like my favorite variation. So I always kind of have it in. Um, I feel like it's really, a lot of power lifters, well, bench pressers, um, their main issue is actually shifting it off the chest. And I feel like that's not actually practiced a lot. And I feel like um, where I'm really good at is actually shifting it off my chest. So I can actually, um, so it kind of gives me kind of, I don't have to apply more, like, you know, more effort when I get to the top because I've, I've applied so much effort from the bottom. Um, so rap, rap press for me is, is my favorite variation. Um, and obviously on Tuesday and Thursday, it's, it's like back day. So everything's focused on trying to get as a, well, as a, a strong back as possible to support the, the bench press. Um, yeah. And also, you know, promotes balance it helps my injury prevention, and it means that you know I'm a all-round strength athlete rather than just a pressing athlete. Yeah. Mm. And I don't do no cardio. That's terrible. No cardio. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, how has your training philosophy or your approach to training developed over the years? Um. To be honest, it it really hasn't changed that much. I think I'm really kind of lucky that um, I've had some really good coaches. Um, so you know my philo my philosophy is all about like kind of you know progressive overload, but do it in a, in a safe way. So like mm -hmm. even if you only add a kilo in the week after, you're still progressing. Or if you do like more kind of sets at a certain weight that you couldn't do last week, that's still progress. So mm. for me, it's not about massive gains; it's about the small gains done consistently. Yeah. Because eventually, like a lot of people, you know, powerlifters are all about kind of ego and feeling that. A lot of, I see a lot of mistakes about kind of people going for, you know, weights that they're going to fail, and I feel like, you know, for me, for me, I never fail reps, um, because one, it's dangerous, two, you literally open yourself to injury, because it, it is max. Obviously, it's more than max. Um, so, and for me, like it kind of, you know, mentally when you fail something you feel quite rubbish mm. you, you don't want that like so for me I, I never fail reps and you know I always kind of have kind of depending on what kind of block I am I always kind of leave one rep in reserve no matter what unless I'm going for one RM test um, I feel mm. like you know, for me it's all about consistency and you know that, that's how kind of I progress things and that's how I see things um, yeah so yeah don't, don't fail reps I think Thomas and I probably both agree with that, don't you, Thomas? Yeah, no, no, that's awesome, and it's it's cool to see. Like, a, I mean, if you average your progress out over the last uh, twelve or thirteen you've, years, you've been competing, you've just been putting in the work and making consistent, steady progress. I, I think the average works out to less than ten kilos a year, which is perfect. Yeah, you know, exactly. that's how you've taken your bench from one hundred to two hundred. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've, I've done it in a safe way that hasn't actually. Um, give me any long-term injuries so um, yeah I think you know with, with the team that I've had we've, we've, we've kind of been it's not going to be perfect but it's been very very close to you know a, a program that has definitely worked for me yeah yeah that's really cool um, do you have anything else you want to talk about Thomas no no I think uh, I think that sums up the the, the the chat nicely hearing about how you train uh, after all the other stuff we covered that's really cool thank you um, so we have a series of questions that we worked out early on in this process were going to be our like questions for um, guests. I don't remember all of them exactly. Um, I have a suspicion I might have written them down. But um, one of them was around uh, how... Like, what's one thing, be it in training or in life or whatever it is, that you used to believe really strongly and you've recently changed your mind on like last yeah you know, let's say last five years what was something that you oh like in the last five years you would have put a stake in the ground and said this is what i believe and you've since changed your mind on so training wise um i used to do something that's actually not kind of common for, for bench presses so i used to love in my kind of general prep phase to do eight reps to do eight reps and people ask me oh yeah but so far from a one rep max like how do you predict that and you know mm. how does that get you strong so I, m my argument for eight reps is that um one it kind of lays so for me 
like if you say that your one RM is like a pyramid, right? So just say the, the peak of the pyramid is I don't know like 200. You want the biggest base possible to try and kind of you know to start that process of building them strength um, strength blocks. That's yeah, what I think. So yeah. the bigger the base, hopefully the bigger the tip. Yes, of course. And, and um, that's, cl that's classic Louis Simmons. Yeah, that, that's what. That's what how tall is a pyramid? As big as its base is wide. So uh, I've always had that kind of mentality that you know, one, it's you know, it gives you a big base. It's light enough that you can practice your technique, but also heavy yeah. enough that it's still stimulating, and you're yes. also building muscle as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Recently, I found that actually. You actually don't need more than six reps, uh -huh. and that for me kind of like really upset me. Because <laughs> it, it actually worked for me for, for the last ten years, uh -huh. um, and it also gets you bench press fit. I call it bench press fit, where uh -huh. it allows you to prepare yourself for the future strength clocks. Yeah. Um, so for, for me, that's why I use eight reps. But I found that recently that you know six reps is probably the max I should have done, like done to. Uh -huh. So I've had to kind of change my kind of view on that, and I used to always be like a firm believer in the eight reps in the general prep places. But it's not, it's not, yeah. like, it's not gonna hurt a novice. Yeah, yeah. It what like mm. for me, like for me, novice is all about technique, and the eight reps, mm -hmm. it you know, it, it makes you kind of practice your technique more often. So it's not, gonna, yeah. it's not gonna hurt. But maybe at the top, top level, maybe not do eight reps. Yeah, I mean, it's a, re it's, a, it's a reflection of your evolution of experience, right? Now you're a, a much more experienced, top-hand, advanced lifter. Uh, things have to change for you to continue to make progress. Um, one of the other questions is, uh, if you could have dinner with anyone on Earth that's alive right now, who would it be? Well, I met my hero, Sylvester Stallone, this year. Oh, wow. Um, incredible, incredible man. Because obviously I, yeah. I grew up with Rocky, and that's where my mindset is. I feel like yeah. I'm like a legless, real-life Rocky Balboa. So if there's going to be a film out, <laughs> I want to be in it. Um, the other one is, for me, Sylvester Stallone. Oh, not Sylvester Stallone. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, uh -huh. Like, you know, he's definitely a man that I really want to meet and kind of speak about his kind of philosophies. Because I do love his philosophy about working hard and you've got 24 yeah. hours in a day, you sleep six, and then you work for, you know, the 18. Like, that's a great philosophy yeah. to have. That's why he's a very successful man. Um, yeah, and also giving something back. You know, that's I love. I love that, um, and that's hopefully what I'm trying to do with the anti-doping stuff to leave a legacy that actually kind of you know is you know, is, a, is a big issue, but also at the same time it, it it kind of affects the global athlete community because you know mm -hmm. the consensus is that we want clean sport and you know they want to compete on even playing field. And I feel like yeah. we need to keep fighting that, and I think that best for me it's a, it's, it's a way of giving something back. Mm. So I, I did actually write down the questions, Thomas. Um, the other one, oh, yeah, yeah, I just found them. I went back through my notes and found it's, them. I remember one more. It's one piece of training advice that you'd give everyone, right? Yeah. So there's the it's it, but it was more uh, aimed at the novice sort of more intermediate level because obviously you're a very elite lifter, um, and therefore the advice you would give yourself is probably a little bit different to the advice you'd give to someone who's relatively new to the sport, maybe only a couple of years training experience, like. What's mm. the best piece of advice you could give someone in that instance? So thinking when I was a novice, um, my number one kind of tip is, this is probably sounds silly, but patience. Um, yeah. So many people try kind of pack on the weight when they're not ready for it. Um, yeah. Or not going to work for it. Because they see other things, they see other people, and they, can tr they try and replicate that. And for me, in, like, training is like personal. Um, and you should kind of, do what you're kind of capable of and not try and attempt things that you're not not yet anyway so for me like you need to be patient with yourself and the process so trust in that process and be consistent in that process and you know eventually like you will improve you just have to be patient with yourself and that's the one thing I would probably give myself if I saw myself at 16 now uh, just be patient because I used to be not patient at all like it, sometimes I'd be so frustrated and angry that I'm not improving and the advice I got from coaches is got to be patient and put in the work, trust in that process, don't divert and try, you know, come up with silly training programs you other people do just to try and kind of, you know, 
try and improve. Um, there's no quick fixes mm. in sport, especially in strength sport. Like, yeah. it takes you years to get strong. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's what I say to novices. Yeah, cool. And look, I think that echoes a lot of what Thomas and I have said to every novice lifter we've ever dealt with. This is, I always like to say, it's it's not a sport of uh, days, weeks, and months, but it's a sport of months, years, years. and decades. Because um, mm. I think that's that's where the best performers come from. You know, you get the guys like Ed Cohn's always the best example I use. The, the, the dude competed at the top for 20 years, and he got mm. better every year for 20 years. You know, that's where a a real strength sport is and I know I have seen and I'm sure Thomas has plenty of lifters who get into powerlifting get really really good in that first two years and then disappear completely because yeah, it's hard for them to accept that actually that process will slow down yeah yeah exactly yeah um, the, so the last question which is actually the first question but we've done this in a slightly roundabout order um, is your favourite lifting memory oh my favourite height so people think and probably the silver medal in um, Rio but it, but it actually wasn't my favourite memory. So this is probably sounds really like weird to people, but um, four weeks before the final um, qualifier for the Beijing Paralympic Games, um, I was about 10 kilo away from um, qualifying. So back then, I had to be the top 10 in the world just to go. Right. So obviously mm -hmm. at 18. Um, I've only been in sport for 18 months. We thought actually it might be a little bit too early for me. And I was, so for me to qualify, I needed about 180 kilo to qualify. And I've been stuck on 170 for six months. Like really upset with myself. And it got to December and I thought, you know what? I'm probably not gonna make Beijing. I have to accept the fact that I've come so close, but I just have to accept that like, I'm just not good enough right now. And you know, I'm only 18 and there'll be other opportunities. Um, so there was a, my kind of last training session before the qualifier, it went rubbish. It was terrible. And my coach sat me down and he had a white gun at me. He had a white, like, like I've, never, I've never seen, like, because the last kind of 18 months working with him, um, you know, it was awesome. Then suddenly he was switched. And he was like, You are so capable of doing this, but it's your mind. Your mind is letting you down. I was like, oh, What are you talking about? You're making me cry. Um, but you know what, he, he made me realise actually, like, physically, I was hitting numbers that meant that actually I was, I was a far bigger bench than the 170. Like, I was definitely a 180, but mentally was yeah. trying to kind of cope with it. I think it's the fact that it was a, you know, Beijing qualifier, this has been the dream, and the fact that it was actually getting real. Um, it's a lot of pressure at it, that yeah, point. Yeah, especially for an 18 year old. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the final qualifier was on my birthday. Yeah, right. So, oh, so he goes okay. to the, uh, he goes, um, so we got to the competition and I thought to myself, well, you know, I just have to accept the fact that I'm not going, but I'm just going to try and get a personal best. And at the time, my personal best was probably 70 in comp. So he uh, comes up to me, he's like, right, you're going to start on 72 and a half. I was like, what? He's like, I'm going to start you on 172 and a half. I was like, I've got my personal 170, I don't understand. He's like, well, you have to qualify, 180 is the qualification. Right? There's no point you, you know, us going holding back. This is your only opportunity. You've got three lefts. I yeah. think you can do it. Your number suggests, you know, that I'm right and that's your brain. He goes, now prove it to me. How much do you want this? Like, if you really want to go to the games, today's the day. To, to this is the only opportunity you're going to get. This is your last shot. It's your fucking birthday. Fucking, you know, go earn yeah, that yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was completely shitting myself, thinking, I'm, I'm gonna bum. I'm gonna bum, like, what? I'm, I'm, I'm like panicking. So, um, 172 and a half, got it, couldn't believe it. 175, got it. And I was like, oh my god. So I equaled the British senior record that had been broken for 25 years. And obviously, I was a junior. Um, so I was like, oh my god, I'm five kilo away. So, so he's like, right, I'm gonna put 180 on. So this is it, last attempt give this he's like you've already got a PB mm -hmm. now so actually you're in better shape than you thought you were yeah let's just put it on yeah so I went out yeah thinking oh my god like I've got one lift left I don't know how on earth I've not bombed yet um, <laughs> and yeah I went out and I got it and it was the best cake I've ever had <laughs> so for me like even though it wasn't at a major championship 
that yeah. memory for me on my birthday was the yeah, best yeah, yeah. ever. And I, I, could, I could actually not be able to replicate that. Yeah. It's crazy. That's so cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think that's a perfect story to end things on. I think, um, yeah. unless you've got some other crazy stories, I don't think we're going to beat a story no, like yeah, that. You're not going to do a story like that. Yeah, because that's the sort of story that gives me goosebumps, you know? Like, I, yeah, that idea sure. that it all comes down to one opportunity and you made it, and that's fucking awesome, man. Well, I think. it just shows you, um, as a novice, you have to actually rely on the person coaching you. Because mm. I, I thought it was crazy. Um, so, you know, to a lot of novice lifters, as I said, like trust in the process, um, and, I, and that day I did, and uh, luckily I, you know, came through. Yeah, awesome. That's fantastic. Um, so, uh, if people want to follow you, find out more about you, where can they do that? Um, Plug so all your social media handles and your blue tick. I've got my yeah. So um, on Instagram, I'm Ali Jawad Powerlifter. Um, How do you so, spell your last name? Just so for it's, people. So it's uh, J A W A D. So Ali Jawad Powerlifter. Um, I've got a blue tick, so you should recognise me. Um, I've also got a picture of me and Stallone, so you should definitely recognize that. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of my posts are about kind of tra- well, training videos and your senior bench press, and yeah, like I'm obsessed with bench press. Um, and obviously. obviously. <laughs> and obviously, like some anti doping stuff in there as well. Yeah, cool. Um, so, yeah, cool. Like, give me a follow and see if you, you know, like my bench press. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time, Ali. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's been great. I think we'll um, leave things there. Uh, If you're listening and or watching and you want to leave us a five-star review, that'd be great. Tell your friends, share it with your friends. And um, yeah. Yeah, I'm just turning off my camera. Catch everyone soon. Thank you.